By 1955, two armed camps, the Soviet bloc and the so-called Western bloc, dominated by the USA, faced each other along what had come to be known as the Iron Curtain, a line drawn through the heart of Europe. Tensions were high along the line, but they were highest in Germany, a nation divided by the rival powers in the eastern and western zones of occupation. No country came close to suffering the losses at the hands of the Germans that were sustained by the Soviet Union in the Second World War, and the Russians were determined to block the rebirth of a strong and independent Germany. The United States, on the other hand, regarded Germany as a minor threat in the face of what seemed to be a Soviet aim to take over Europe by force. Suspicious of Russia's intentions, the U.S. rejected a Soviet proposal to reunify Germany under a coalition regime a plan that could have left the nation unarmed and vulnerable to attack. Instead, the three western zones were to be merged into a nation capable of forming a front line of defense against a Russian invasion. This plan, set in motion in 1949, was to have far-reaching repercussions. West Germany, 1949. In the Allied-occupied zone, Konrad Adenauer was installed as Chancellor of the first German government since the Second World War. Though initially the new nation's foreign policy remained under Allied control, in 1954 the three Western powers officially granted the Federal Republic its independence as a sovereign state in the anti-communist camp. At an hour, a staunch conservative and lifelong foe of both the Nazis and the communists, grimly pledged West Germany to the NATO alliance, rebuilding an army that was soon to become the largest in West Europe. But the prospect of a rearmed pro-Western Germany alarmed the new Russian premier Nikita Khrushchev, who countered by creating the Warsaw Pact defensive alliance among the states in the Soviet bloc. The threat of global nuclear war suddenly loomed larger. The game of terror had begun 10 years before when an American B-29 dropped the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima. When informed that the doomsday weapon had done its job, President Truman is said to have exclaimed, this is the greatest thing in history. nuclear inferno had consumed over a hundred thousand lives, but a costly war was over. When the damage done by the bomb became known, Truman redoubled his resolve to keep a tight grip on the weapon, but that dream soon evaporated. In 1949, the Soviet Union tested its first atomic bomb. Though it was revealed that some U.S. secrets had been stolen, it was later disclosed that the Russian bomb had been in development throughout the war. The American answer came in 1952, with the detonation of the first hydrogen bomb weapon more potent than a hundred A-bombs and designed to assure the U.S. the nuclear edge. Albert Einstein, whose work had helped develop the bomb, now urged that all nuclear weapons be destroyed. But his arguments were to fall on deaf ears in Washington. As former British Prime Minister Churchill told a joint session of Congress, They say this, members of the Congress, be careful about all things. Therefore, not to let go of the atomic weapon until you are sure, and more than sure, that other means of preserving peace are in your hands. Even as Churchill spoke, both Great Britain and the Soviet Union were preparing to test their own hydrogen bombs. The nuclear race was on. It seemed that only a meeting at the summit could stop it. Geneva, Switzerland. From the 
Around the world, the press converged in 1955 to cover the first meeting of the big powers since World War II. By the time the first head of state arrived, France had joined the nuclear club, and now with England, she proposed immediate and total disarmament. Before his arrival, Khrushchev had accepted the Anglo-French proposal, and it was hoped that with U.S. agreement, the nuclear race could be halted. With the U.S. monopoly on nuclear weapons broken, President Eisenhower arrived in Geneva ready to bargain, but not to back down. I have come here in this beautiful country of yours to meet with my colleagues from other countries to see whether uh, it is not possible to find some road that will lead all mankind into a more tranquil, better, fuller way of life. I thank you very much. Unwilling to give up the lead in weapons, Ike proposed a freeze backed up by aerial inspection with no provision for disarmament. To this, the Russians said, yet. And so the mutual suspicions mounted, the nuclear race resumed at a fevered pace, and talk began of a preventive war to bring the Russians to their knees. The Soviet Union, now encircled by U.S. bases, waived the threat and responded with a new initiative. While stockpiling nuclear weapons, Khrushchev pushed the principle of peaceful coexistence even extending a warm welcome to Chancellor Adenauer, head of the dreaded West German regime. To Russia's allies, it seemed a clear signal. The Soviet Union was a paper tiger, and its stranglehold on the satellite nations was open. Hungary in the autumn of 1956. Angry anti-Soviet emotions exploded when the Russians attempted to depose a moderate communist leader who had called for free elections and the withdrawal of Russian troops. Red flags burned and Russian books fed the flames as eight years of Soviet domination came to a crashing end. Driven by their dreams of freedom, the rebels pushed the government into a plan to withdraw from the Warsaw Pact. Khrushchev had reached his limit. But the Soviets had at first given ground, the threat to their military alliance was more than they could endure. Against what the Russians called the imperialist West, Hungary was the first line of defense. The Russians were resolved to hold. A cannon fire from Soviet tanks was met with armed resistance as Hungarians fought for their nation's right to independence. For five days, Hungary flaunted its freedom, but in the end, the rebels were no match for the might of the Red Army. Over 100,000 Hungarians fled their country, but thousands more had died, waiting in vain for the aid from the Western Allies that never was to arrive. The United Nations debated a resolution demanding that the Soviets withdraw, but Russia vetoed all attempts by the UN to take action. For Eisenhower, it was election time, and he had privately reassured Khrushchev he would not go to war over Hungary. Buoyed by his success at the polls, the president promised Americans that the communists would win no more ground. The Eisenhower doctrine was soon to be put to the test. In July of 1958, a task force of U.S. Marines supported by the Navy's 6th Fleet rolled into Lebanon to 
suppress a coup which threatened to replace a pro-Western regime with one that was friendly to the Soviets. Eisenhower had recommitted the U.S. to the global role of policemen of the world, putting out fires wherever they flared up within the Western Bloc. In Lebanon, the rebels got the warning and gave up without a shot. As the Soviets had done in Hungary, the U.S. had done in Lebanon, serving notice on the nations in its sphere of influence that unfriendly coups would be met with American guns. A month after the invasion, the Marines were withdrawn. The fleet remained ready to return if U.S. interests in the Mideast were threatened. In the U.N., however, and among many neutral nations, the Soviets had scored a triumph. Many uncommitted nations joined the Russians in condemning the U.S. action. But as the U.N. debated, the Cold War got hot. To prepare for an atomic war, the U.S. tested tanks and troops in close contact with nuclear weapons. Throughout the 1950s, hundreds of bombs were exploded and the data from the tests was used to estimate the effects of high doses of radiation upon men and military equipment. In planes that flew above the test site, volunteers donned goggles and other types of eyewear and stared directly at the fireball. Then they tested their eyes for damage caused by the blacks. Over 6,000 men took part in the tests. Many of them huddled in trenches within only a few miles of ground zero. While the full impact on the human volunteers might not be known for years, demonstrations were designed to reassure Americans that a nuclear war was survivable. In homes built of wood, bricks, or concrete, mannequins stood in for people while cameras rolled to record the probable results of a Russian attack. Close to the blast, a concrete blockhouse weathered the initial shock while flammable objects smoldered in a storm of blazing gas. For flimsier structures, the end was quick. The furious nuclear wind ripped wood and plaster apart. In the wake of the test, engineers from the Atomic Energy Commission probed the ruins with Geiger counters to help the government devise new guidelines for nuclear survival. Since victory in a nuclear war would belong to the survivors, millions of dollars were spent throughout the 1950s studying the short and long-term effects of radiation on living things. Fish were raised in radioactive ponds to measure safe levels of exposure, results which could be used to gauge the likely effects on humans. In other tests, sheep were fed radioactive foods to judge the effect of fallout, while as a positive offshoot of the nuclear age, radioisotopes were developed which could be used as tracers in medical research. After the patient had swallowed the isotope, its path through his body could be mapped with a radiation detector as a way to locate possible tumors. The fear of a nuclear war launched a flurry of A-bomb alerts, as in cities across the nation, Americans rehearsed for the nuclear holocaust. Basements served as fallout shelters, and while restaurant patrons and office workers took refuge underground, students were schooled in the basics of A-bomb survival. In 
the nation's capital, more elaborate measures were devised to ensure the business of government could continue, even in the midst of an H-bomb attack. Key personnel would be sped to underground strongholds while ordinary Americans made an orderly retreat from the city. To guard against a sneak attack, a far-flung network of radar stations was completed in the 1950s, a distant early warning system designed to detect Russian bombers before they reached the borders of the continental United States. This was Lopo, a subterranean nerve center to which all of the radar stations reported. Here on a status board the size of a house, TV cameras were set to track the invasion. The heart of the system was the hotline, a direct link to the Pentagon over which the command for a counter-strike would come. Pilots of the Strategic Air Command were on round-the-clock alert, ready on a moment's notice, to deliver a payload of nuclear bombs to any part of the world. But though billions of dollars were spent on the air defense system, it was largely rendered obsolete by the introduction in 1954 of the Soviet's ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, capable of wiping out Washington before the first air warning was sounded. In the frantic race to close the missile gap, the U.S. shifted its focus from bombers to rockets, the results which at first were discouraging. From repeated failures, lessons were learned by the engineers, and by 1955, an arsenal of missiles for defense and counterattack had taken their places in the standard arsenal of war. The U.S. fleet of nuclear subs was the American response to Russia's land-based ICBMs. Launched from the subs, missiles could flatten Moscow from any part of the world. The Polaris missile fired from underwater and armed with a nuclear warhead promised to place the U.S. in the position of strength it needed to persuade the Soviets to listen. But again, developments in the USSR were to frustrate America's plans. Werner von Braun, the father of the Nazi V2, met the press in 1957 to respond to the launch of Sputnik, the world's first man-made satellite, a potential base for a surprise attack from space. But von Braun vowed that the US would catch up. And the crash program began that was short on success and long on spectacular failure. Millions of dollars had gone up in flames before the day came when the Redstone rocket was ready. Only four months had passed in Sputnik, and with the Explorer 1 satellite in orbit, America had checkmated Russia in the race for space. Here was a new frontier. U.S. and Russian astronauts began training at once for the first manned space flights. The Cold War had moved into a new dimension as competition between the superpowers sparked the most rapid explosion of innovation in a century of swift technological change.
While a Russian in 1961 would be the first man in space, the U.S. was close behind. Now, with the specter of a space war before him and the fate of the Earth in the balance, Premier Khrushchev came to Barton. I greet you and welcome you to Washington and to the United States. The beginning of a dialogue between the two leaders seemed to clear the way to a reduction of the tensions which threatened the peace of the world. Moscow, 1959. Everything that I say uh, will be recorded and translated and will be uh, carried all over the Soviet Union. The warm smiles were to fade by the following spring. In May 1960, on the eve of a summit meeting, Russian guns brought down a high-flying U.S. spy plane deep in Soviet territory. Condemned in the United Nations, the U.S. suffered a severe blow to its credibility. The door to negotiations with Khrushchev slammed shut, and the path was paved for a change at the top in Washington. Vice President Nixon was a Republican choice, a determined opponent of communism at home and abroad. But Nixon faced a tough campaign against a new force in American politics. John F. Kennedy, the Democrats' candidate, believed that peaceful coexistence with the Soviets was the only hope for the world, and a majority of Americans agreed. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Kennedy, however, added a warning. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. By the time of Kennedy's inauguration, the feud between the Soviet Union and the United States had dominated the full 15 years of the post-World War II era. And indications were that the great struggle for the hearts and minds of humanity had far from run its course. A half century after the Russian Revolution, the Soviets remained unswervingly committed to their revolutionary ideals, and Khrushchev was to boast that in the long run, communism would bury the capitalist system. Time would tell, but as the 1960s began, both the big powers had settled into an uneasy truce, backing away from the head-on collision that surely would have spelled suicide for both sides. That fragile balance passed for peace in 1961, and an optimist could consider it progress. It would be up to future generations to do better.